back to Ken's presentation now. Um, so uh, Ken has uh, he received his bachelor's degree in biological oceanography from the University of Washington and his master's and PhD degrees in oceanography from the University of Alaska. His research is focused on uh, applying the ROMS numerical modeling system with an embedded ecosystem component to help elucidate the physical and biological mechanisms influencing interannual differences in zooplankton populations on the northern Gulf of Alaska shelf. And the work that Ken will be discussing today uh, in part was done in the context of the North Pacific Research Board's Gulf of Alaska Integrated Ecosystem Research Program that involved um, extensive multidisciplinary uh, field data collection as well as modeling at the same time and provided a nice opportunity for some real iterative interactions between the field scientists and the modelers to help improve uh, the model. And so uh, what Ken will be talking to you about today is uh, some of the nutrient phytoplankton zooplankton modeling that he did in the context of that program and how changing the source of the runoff really created some uh, very interesting differences in the um, on the ecology side in the marine system. So uh, Ken, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for making time to join us today. Okay, and I'll well, let me try to uh, put my screen on here. I'm going to. Uh, can people see this? No, we're not able to. Okay, so let me just. Uh, okay, if you can't see it, then it's not working. Uh, I thought it was showing my screen, but I guess it isn't. We did uh, can you put a moment, but not anymore. Yep, I am putting your presentation on now. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, this talk is based on something that I gave uh, at the last, let's go back to the previous slide, at the last Ocean Sciences meeting. And there the uh, emphasis of the talk was on the springtime net caught and simulated mesozooplankton biomass relative to the spring simulated primary production on the western Gulf of Alaska shelf. And I've just added a couple of slides uh, at Danielle's suggestion uh, to talk a little bit about uh, glaciers and runoff on the Gulf of Alaska shelf as mainly an iron source. Uh, and the authors of the talk are shown down below and additional participants involved in the model development are listed uh, below that and the funding agencies below that. I think there's a couple of funding agencies that I, I'm not aware of because I'm not actually the PI. Uh, so these are the ones that I'm aware of. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. So this shows the Gulf of Alaska uh, main current systems, the North Pacific current uh, bifurcates off Washington state and the Northern branch forms the Alaska stream, which is one of the major current systems uh, off the shelf of the Northern Gulf of Alaska. The other one is this gray line that moves along the coastline there. And that's the uh, Alaska coastal current. Uh, the bars represent uh, the precipitation. We have low pressure systems that move from the uh, west to the east and bump, bump up against the coastal mountain ranges. And they dump a great deal of precipitation in the coastal mountain ranges. And uh, when that uh, melts, it runs into the ocean. And so that's our major runoff source. Uh, these currents form eddies and meanders, which mix the ocean water with the shelf water to varying degrees depending on where you are on the shelf. And we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so the major goal of this whole operation was to elucidate the mechanisms linking oceanography and the ecosystem response to climate forcing on the northern Gulf of Alaska shelf. Uh, Ideally, uh, what we would like to do is be able to collect samples along the Seward line shown here 
uh, and be able to interpret them in the broader context of the shelf as a whole. But this is complicated because the oceanic water, uh, shown in blue here, dark blue, is a low chlorophyll, high nutrient, small cell iron environment. By high nutrients, that's mostly nitrate. It's a micro, uh, macronutrient. Uh, whereas the uh, coastal environment uh, is uh, characterized by intense spring blooms, it's nitrate limited. So the macronutrient uh, is limited along the coast. Uh, and it's uh, usually large diatoms that uh, make the bloom there. And there's a lot of iron near the coast. So at any point in space and time, the results of what we're getting along the Seward line there are a complicated mix of uh, the oceanic and the coastal conditions. Uh, and this complicates interpretation of these results that we get on these cruises in the broader context of the shelf as a whole over years or multiple years. Uh, because we had enough support only for six uh, cruises in 1998 to 2004 and uh, two cruises per year from 2005 to 2018. Uh, so we're using the ROMS numerical model as a formal mathematical method of extending our results from these field observations uh, to beyond the specific dates and places where these samples were taken. Uh, so we could go to the next slide. So uh, runoff is important to the biology of the Gulf of Alaska because the Jew uh, Gulf of Alaska is uh, an iron limited system. Uh, and measurements indicate that most dissolved iron is entering the system with the runoff. And initially, we used the Royer runoff files to run the model, but these files consisted of single monthly averages uh, for the entire Gulf of Alaska between the Canadian boundary and Winnemac Pass. So we transitioned to using the Hill model. And these files are much, uh, this, this model consists of daily means, essentially, for all runoff points along the coast between the Canadian boundary and, and the west end of Kodiak. So it's a much more detailed model. Uh, and we ran tests comparing both the hill and the Royer runoff. And the total magnitudes of the two were quite similar. Uh, but the peak uh, was displaced by about two months earlier in the hill versus the Royer runoff. And the persistent downwelling of winds due to these storms that are moving in an easterly direction across the Gulf of Alaska are pushing the surface water shoreward until it butts up against the uh, outer boundary of the ACC where it sinks. So this downwelling is essentially pushing this uh, high nutrient, low iron water shoreward. And the mixing of the iron replete coastal water with the iron limited oceanic water is determining the magnitude and the distribution of production on the shelf. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So the model consists of nutrients. It's nitrate, iron, and ammonium. And the small and large phytoplankton consume the nutrients. And the small and large microzooplankton consume the phytoplankton. And the copepods consume both the microzooplankton and the phytoplankton, but the euphosids consume only the uh, large uh, microzooplankton and uh, the phytoplankton. Uh, and the bodies, the dead material goes into the detritus pool, which sinks out. And this ecosystem model is embedded in the ROMS model, which is the three-dimensional Malay in which all of this is taking place. Uh, and the ROMS three-dimensional physical model is driven by the NOAA climate forecast system reanalysis model output. So the whole thing is driven uh, by climate, essentially, by the, the weather forecasts. Uh, and we run the model first 
in this NEP grid, this large grid, which goes uh, from uh, Baja California up to Siberia. And uh, we use that to get the boundary conditions for the finer grid. The large grid was a 10 kilometer grid. The finer grid is three kilometers. And this is fine enough to resolve the eddies and meanders, which are moving the water back and forth across the shelf. Uh, so all of our data will be from this small grid, which runs from the Canadian boundary to be to the west of the Shumigan Island. Uh, and then our data are collected along the Seward line shown here, where GAC-1 is the one nearest shore and GAC-13 is offshore. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. So this shows the seasonal <coughs> distribution of primary production. And during uh, February and January, the uh, upper left-hand slide, uh, the production is about 15 grams for that period, the maximum production. And most of it is occurring near shore and it's very low production because the system is light limited during this period. Uh, but during March, May, the slide to the right, uh, we start to see relatively high production going on. Uh, the maximum is 120 there. And it's occurring mainly near shore and in Shelikov Strait between Kodiak Island and uh, the mainland and to the west of Kodiak Island. Uh, but when we get into summer, uh, we get a lot of production in Mower Cook Inlet uh, and off uh, uh, Prince William Sound and uh, to the uh, west of Kodiak Island along the shelf break and in the outer part of Kodiak Island. And by fall, uh, the production is mainly off Prince William Sound and in Lower Cook Inlet. So there's a progression of where the production is occurring. Uh, are people aware of where all of these places are? Because I don't have a pointer. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so this shows the iron concentration uh, and the nitrate concentration. The lower slides are the nitrate concentration. The upper slides are the iron concentration. And since iron is entering the system with runoff, most of the iron is concentrated near the coast. And because the iron is concentrated near the coast, the nitrate begins to decrease near the coast. You can see that for the March, May uh, data here or model output here. And by summer, you can see that the uh, iron has become much more concentrated due to much greater runoff uh, in the summer. And uh, you can see that the nitrate has just about gone from the shelf, except for those areas where there was low iron because of the uh, downwelling uh, and the pushing of this iron poor uh, oceanic water onto the shelf. Uh, if there are any questions, be, uh, feel free to ask. And I'll go to the next slide. So to characterize what was going on on the shelf as a whole for our bar graphs, which are shown further on, uh, we developed these polygons. And the red polygon characterizes the Seward line, uh, which is shown in orange there. And it's that area of the shelf where there's low iron concentration. So this uh, gray area is the same thing in the lower plot there. The, simulated dissolved iron climatology uh, for March and May. Uh, so that's why we produced this Seward line separate from the larger green shelf plot, which is the western shelf boundary, is the uh, coastline and the outer boundary is the shelf break. And you can see the uh, eastern uh, shelf shown there. and then. The uh, basin polygons go from the shelf break 
to 200 kilometers beyond the shelf break, and they just simply char uh, characterize positions, uh, conditions off the shelf uh, for the adjacent polygons that are on the shelf. Uh, and that's essentially everything on this slide, and we can go to the next one. Uh, so here I'm emphasizing uh, the, or showing in this uh, right upper right slide, the seasonal concentration of the net caught copepod, and this is in terms of mean biomass along the shelf. And what is really apparent here is these two, the, the kind of purple and the gray, which are the neocalamus, really dominate the spring, the May time. Uh, samples that we collected. And this is over several years. This is an average over several years. Uh, and the reason this is happening is because these neocalamus originate off the shelf break, shown by the uh, little line there uh, on the plot uh, to the uh, left. And uh, they they originate off the shelf break at 500 to 1,000, 2,000 meters depth where they're uh, undergoing diapause. They reproduce in January and the larvae and the eggs come up to the surface. And then they're pushed uh, shoreward with this downwelling that's going on. And as they're pushed shoreward, they're also growing because this is the production season. And so you can see this very large growth in the April and May uh, time series here. Uh, in the plot to the right. And um, I did a plot of all the May samples against the uh, salinity, the lower axis is the salinity, and uh, the uh, y axis is the power transformed biomass. And there's a distinct relationship shown here, negative, where the lower salinities have the higher concentrations of these neocalamus. And the reason this is happening is because the neocalamus that are caught near the shore have experienced uh, higher production during their life cycle. Uh, and so there's greater survival and greater biomass in those samples relative to the ones that are collected in the higher salinity, which is further offshore, where you're having more iron limitation to this system. Uh, and. Uh, we can uh, go on to the next slide, I think. Uh, so this slide here uh, shows the climatology of the seasonal cycle of simulated chlorophyll. And that's the solid line. Uh, and then we also have the climatology of the simulated uh, net cot or uh, simulated neocalamus biomass in the upper 20 meters along the sewer line. And that's this peak line here, uh, which is shown by the arrows. Uh, and the reason it drops here uh, after uh, June is because these animals are finished with their uh, uh, grazing period of their life cycle, and they're swimming down to 500 to uh, 2,000 meters depth to undergo diapause until the following year. So they actually leave the shelf. They're gone from the upper 25 meters. Uh, and the gray bar shows the net caught neocalamus. So the model is pretty uh, capable of reproducing the, uh, what we're actually seeing in the environment. And this uh, sort of dip in the chlorophyll uh, is probably the result of a lot of grazing going on. Uh, during this period is the biomass of these animals increases. So they're actually probably able to uh, exert some top-down control on the phytoplankton growth. Uh, and we can go on to the uh, next slide. Uh, so the top slide on the right-hand side shows the uh, simulated primary production anomalies along the sewer line. Uh, for each one of the years that are listed on the x-axis there. And we can see that most of the high primary production is uh, going on, the uh, stuff above 
the average line, which is 56 grams, and shown as zero here on this chart, uh, is uh, the, high, uh, the highest production is occurring before 2006 up to 2006. And after 2006 to 2012, the anomalies are all negative. And that's the same also for the simulated copepod production. The anomalies are positive before 2006 and negative afterwards. <clears throat> and the lower two graphs show the uh, total net caught copepods along the Seward line. And the air bars are 95% confidence intervals. And so we see a similar pattern with high values tending to occur uh, before 2006 and low values afterwards. And we see to a lesser degree with the neocalamus alone. Uh, and I can go on, we can go on to the next slide here. Uh, so what this shows is uh, we just did uh, an analysis of each individual year of primary production uh, against the calanoid carbon biomass for that year along the Seward line. And uh, the simulated production could explain about 65% of the variance in the calanoid biomass and about 44% of the variance in the copepod biomass. Uh, and so we used multiple regressions to characterize the process is affecting primary production and iron concentration by adding, by sequentially adding variables, uh, we can evaluate uh, which variables are most influential uh, to the simulated production and iron concentration. And we can go on to the next slide. Uh, and I won't talk m about these plots here, but I'll summarize the results. Uh, in March and May, the primary production is controlled primarily by iron concentration. PAR and nitrate seem to have no effect. And the March-May iron is controlled primarily by vertical momentum flux. That's upwelling and downwelling. Uh, and runoff doesn't seem, the magnitude of the runoff doesn't seem to have much effect. Uh, and if we look at September and October, production, we see that the control uh, is by iron, by par, and by nitrate. So there's more involved in the October production than in the March-May production. And the September-October iron concentration is controlled mainly by the uh, vertical momentum flux, the upwelling and downwelling uh, on the shelf in the basin, and uh, also by runoff. And uh, Iron tends to be influenced by the iron concentration in the uh, other seasons of the year. So it's uh, got some inertia there. If it's large in the spring, it's large usually in the later seasons. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so this <clears throat> shows the hill runoff, uh, the upper right-hand slide. And uh, you can see the lowest uh, values usually occur in January, February, and March. And this is because the uh, runoff is sequestered as snow and ice on the continent. And it doesn't begin to uh, really run off until it, it melts. And so we see a, a great increase in April, May, and June with a peak in June for the runoff and then a gradual decline uh, later on as we get uh, fewer storms, and uh, then in October through December, it starts to accumulate as snow and ice again. And the slide right below that is the dissolved iron concentration as measured on the shelf uh, by uh, Aguilar Isla. Uh, and we see that near the coast, which is uh, the distance zero here, the iron concentrations are quite high. Uh, this is the dissolved iron. And then as you get further out beyond, say, station five or six along the Seward line, the uh, iron concentration drops way off until it's below one nanomolar. Uh, so the iron is coming into this system primarily with the, uh, with the runoff. 
Uh, and you can see this uh, going on here in these plots of iron concentration in the upper 25 meters, where the iron is concentrated near the coastline in March, May, and uh, is pushed further out as more runoff comes in. And it occupies almost the entire shelf on the eastern part of the shelf. Uh, and where this downwelling is going on on the uh, western part of the shelf, it remains low during the entire production season. Uh, and we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so to summarize, the ontogenetic migrations of the neocalonists need to be incorporated into the model to get a realistic simulation of the mesoplankton on the shelf, because these animals swim down after they uh, reach their maximum size in June, and they are essentially gone from the shelf, not because they died, but because they just swam down into deep water. Uh, the neocalonists biomass is inversely related to the salinity, and this is probably in response to the elevated production that is occurring on the shelf relative to the basin. And that's due to the uh, iron limitation on, in the basin relative to the coastal area of the shelf. The simulated March-May primary production explains up to 65% of the interannual net caught calanoid biomass on the Seward line in May. Uh, and the interannual differences in the simulated primary production appear to be controlled by interannual differences in iron concentration, particularly in spring. And the iron concentration is influenced primarily by upwelling, downwelling, vertical momentum flux in spring and vertical momentum flux and runoff in the fall. And in the fall, of course, the runoff is more important because it's been collecting throughout the summer and you still have high runoff in the fall. And so it's filling the shelf uh, with the uh, available iron that's coming in with the runoff. Uh, so to improve our model, we need a better understanding of the factors affecting the interannual differences in the primary production on the shelf. And this requires more quantitative information on the sink sources and rates of input and removal of the uh, various iron species, the dissolved organic and particulate iron. And we can move to the next slide. <coughs> the model currently uh, uh, tracks interannual differences in dissolved iron concentration due to runoff, upwelling and downwelling, and iron entering through the boundaries. But other iron sources include dust plumes, bottom sediments and atmospheric deposition. And we have uh, really very little information on that. We know it exists, but we don't have quantitative algorithms which we can use in a model to determine the interannual differences in the amounts of these processes. Uh, iron occurs in a number of states, particulate dissolved and bound to organics. But uh, the model uh, doesn't follow the chemical processes that uh, move the iron from the particulate to the dissolved into the organic bound states. And this is probably a temperature dependent process, but a lot more research has to be done to provide uh, algorithms which we can use in the model uh, to follow these uh, sources of iron in the system. Uh, iron exits the system through sedimentation of organic and inorganic uh, compounds, but we don't have a lot of information yet on the sinking rates or uh, on the iron concentrations in the detritus uh, or on the uh, processes, which are probably driven by oxygen concentration and uh, uh, sediment types and animal concentration of the processes that are bringing that iron back into uh, the dissolved state and back into the water column. So improving the model uh, of the uh, interannual differences in the production on the GOA shelf will require temperature dependent quantitative algorithms describing the above processes. Uh, and one more slide. So I got some questions here, which we can talk about, uh, of what will be the effect of climate change or warming 
on the GOA uh, production cycle, and uh, how will the loss of glaciers, which we assume is going to happen, they're disappearing at a prodigious rate, uh, and the winter snowpack affect production. And the thing I wanted to remind people of is the timing of the spring bloom right now is set by the solar cycle, uh, which warms the surface water and uh, re results in greater stability, so you get a phytoplankton bloom. Uh, but uh, fresh water can also uh, re increase the stability and cause a bloom. And the magnitude of production is set by uh, uh, nutrient availability, and uh, some of it is coming in with the runoff. Uh, so I'll uh, open it up to discussion. Ken, thank you so much for that really wonderful presentation and for the um, questions here to prompt our discussion. So we'll open it up and, and see where the discussion takes us. Does anyone want to begin? We've got uh, a uh, like question. Yeah, you got it, Danielle. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Andy has typed a question into the chat box. Um, feel free to go about it that way, too, if you'd rather not um, use your audio um, microphone. Andy says, uh, you have a few glaciologists on the call. What data would you find useful for us to produce as input to your modeling efforts? Yeah, I think uh, our modeling efforts right now are involved in uh, just measuring the runoff that's going right into the ocean. What the glaciers are doing is providing that runoff. Uh, a certain portion of, of the uh, runoff, and I don't know exactly what that portion is, is coming from glaciers. And these glaciers are slowly disappearing. Like the Columbia Glacier, there's almost nothing left of it. And when I first saw it, it was this huge wall of ice back in the uh, 70s. Uh, so when these glaciers disappear, uh, it's probably going to change the runoff cycle. Uh, and the, what the glaciers are is a sequestered source of uh, precipitation that occurred centuries ago that is now being dumped back into the system but was retained on the continent before because of the uh, colder conditions. Uh, so my guess is what's likely to happen is as these glaciers disappear, the amount of fresh water is going to disappear or it's going to go down. Or it's quite possible that the actual timing of the production cycle will become earlier because we'll get more runoff earlier in the year uh, rather than later in the year because the uh, milt cycle will start earlier. Uh, does that help answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And I have a, a follow up question. So in contemplating on one of your summary slides, Ken, you talked about how um, right now the, your um, ecological model is following the dissolved iron, but not particulate or other, you know, iron and other um, forms. So is, would it be potentially useful to have information, um, you know, field glaciologists could collect uh, the, uh, not only the, the dissolved iron in the water, um, but also, you know, the particulate matter, like that type of observational partitioning of um, the nutrient fluxes coming straight from the glacier snout. Is that something that could be incorporated into your ecological model? Uh, yeah, right now, Aguilar Ice uh, Islas is uh, m measuring the particulate uh, iron and the organic stages of iron in the ocean. The uh, real difficulty is knowing how much these two sources are going to contribute to the actual concentrations of the dissolved iron, which is what the phytoplankton use. Hmm. And that's going to be determined by the rate in the ocean that, say, the particulate uh, releases dissolved iron. Uh, and uh, the rate of scavenging and so on that's going on. And these are all chemical processes. 
that are probably determined by temperature more than anything else, as well as the substrate and the product uh, concentrations. Hmm. And so uh, those are the kinds of things that are likely to increase our understanding of what's going on. Uh, in addition, there were a number of sources of the particulate uh, uh, dust plumes and uh, stuff coming in from uh, the upper atmosphere and so on. And there's really no measurements right now about uh, the magnitude of those things. Uh, and are they differing from year to year? And uh, so we're just kind of ignoring them now because we don't have any data. It could be that most of this particulate material is coming down, or this iron is coming in as particulate, and that it's fairly refractory. And so it may sink out long before it can dissolve uh, and become useful to the phytoplankton. Uh, did that uh, address your question? Yes, thank you. It sounds like in general, there's a need to um, constrain the partitioning, um, not just of the, of the iron coming into the fjord system, um, but also it sounds like of the, the, um, the fresh water discharging from the continent. So I was interested to, I don't mean to uh, monopolize questions either. So if people have uh, something else they want to talk about, feel free to pipe up here in the chat. Um, but there was the slide, Ken, where you had the plot and um, it was a graph, and then there's the vertical gray bar, um, which you said yeah. aligned the front. with, yeah, yeah, aligned with the, that, there it is, yeah. Um, and so I was curious, I mean, that's happening in, uh, you know, sort of springtime, so to that, that to me is, you know, coincides with the peak of the seasonal snow melt. So I was curious, um, I mean, the gray bar is from your um, net, uh, yeah, your net catch. So that's an observation. But then um, mm -hmm. the simulated chlorophyll, did that come from um, the fresh, was that tied to the freshwater discharge modeled by Dave Hill and his treatment of um, melting snow on the uh, continent? Or Yes, it it is. Uh, uh, Dave Hill's model comes in with the fresh water. Uh, well, his the iron comes in with the fresh water, and uh, the fresh water will cause some degree of stabilization of the water column. Uh, but the model could also be improved. I haven't mentioned it by having a wave model put on top of it. The physical model has no wave model right now. And so sometimes what happens is the runoff, if it's uh, brought in as a point source along the uh, coastline, as point sources, it'll run off as a thin layer across the, the uh, shelf. And this never happens in reality because you have a lot of breaking waves. You got, you got storms that are mixing this whole system up. Uh, so the ROMS model really needs, the physicists, the physical modelers really need to develop a wave energy model that can mix uh, this surface so that you don't have this kind of runoff. We've avoided that by inter, uh, introducing the runoff as kind of precipitation within uh, 25 to 30 meter, uh, kilometers of the coast with a uh, exponential uh, decline as you get further from the coast. And uh, that prevents this runoff is a thin layer, uh, but ideally what we would like to have is a, uh, a wave model which can actually mix this system properly, uh, especially during storm events. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, to, to put uh, this, this thing in, in kind of a context, uh, uh, when these uh, uh, plants originally evolved uh, and uh, produced their uh, photosynthesis. Uh, they began dumping large amounts of oxygen into the water. And uh, what they were essentially doing is poisoning themselves 
because what was happening is the uh, oxygen was combining with the iron and the uh, solubility constant is very low for iron oxide. It's about uh, 10 to the minus 15. Uh, and so it could essentially strip out all of the iron from the water column. Uh, and then the uh, plants would, of course, die because they require iron. Uh, but what the plants evolved to do was to release something called ligands into the water, which can bind to that iron and prevent it from forming the oxides and sinking out. And so it's another source of how the iron is used by the phytoplankton uh, along with these uh, its organic uh, compounds. Ken, it looks like you have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, folks are wondering about the resolution of your model. And someone uh, asked, uh, you have two size classes of phytoplankton in the model. Is there spatial or temporal variability in the contributions of these two groups? Uh, yes. Uh, so what was the first question again? Uh, the resolution of the model. OK, yeah, it's a three kilometer resolution model spatially. And uh, I'm running it at a time step of 100 seconds right now. Uh, the reason you have to run it at such a short time step is because the physical model uh, will become unstable uh, if you start to increase the time step. Uh, and there are uh, 42 depth intervals in the model right now. Uh, and uh, the depth is related to the uh, bottom depth or the uh, distance between each depth level is related to the bottom depth. And so uh, to increase the number of uh, levels in the model from 42, you would have to decrease the time step because uh, the uh, system is so dynamic that it will uh, uh, sort of mix too, too fast and the model will become numerically unstable and blow up. Uh, so th those are the resolutions of the model uh, right now. And what was the second question? Uh, you have two size classes of phytoplankton in the model, and mm -hmm. is there spatial temporal variability in the contributions of these two groups? Yes. <clears throat> yes, the uh, small phytoplankton tend to be uh, very dominant uh, in the oceanic environment. And that's because they require less of the iron. They can live better in the oceanic environment. Uh, the large phytoplankton, uh, which I mentioned consists mainly of the centric diatoms, uh, they occur on the shelf primarily. And uh, that's because they require a, a much higher amount of iron in order to bloom successfully. And the large phytoplankton tend to grow faster. They produce these large blooms that uh, you see along the coastline. Uh, whereas the small phytoplankton uh, tend to grow uh, uh, much more slowly. Uh, and while they do occur on the shelf, especially they tend to be more concentrated in the summer. Uh, whereas the diatoms tend to be more concentrated in the spring when you have a lot of nitrate available. Uh, once the nitrate is exhausted, then the smaller phytoplankton tend to become more dominant. Uh, does that cover your, your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. So this is Danielle Dixon. I wanted to point out for everybody on the call, especially the glaciologists that may not be as aware of what's going on on the marine ecosystem side, that um, Ken mentioned that this um, Seward Line time series goes back decades, and it's been funded uh, by various consortia over the years. Um, currently, there's some funding coming from North Pacific Research Board's Long-Term Monitoring Program, the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council with their Gulf Watch Alaska program. And we're really excited that a couple of years ago, National Science Foundation established this project as a long-term ecological research site, essentially um, 
as long as um, things pr keep progressing well in their reviews every five years, it should be maintained as a long-term time series uh, into the future. Um, and that NSF funding has allowed some expansion of the project, too, so there's some more sampling going on uh, east and west of the Seward line and even in Prince William Sound in the near shore. And um, so that project is, uh, they're also doing some very detailed studies of the Copper River plume in the ocean and um, what's going on with those dynamics with the iron inputs and the phytoplankton and the zooplankton. Um, and uh, so Anna Aguilar Islas and Suzanne Strom and others are looking at that in detail. Um, they're actually having a PI meeting this week. Um, uh, about about their program. So uh, this provides a really nice opportunity for folks to really have some uh, continued interactions between um, the glacial com uh, glaciology community and this group to look at what's happening with these ocean interactions and feedbacks. Um, and one thing I'd love to mention, especially because folks from USGS are on the line on the glaciology side, is I had the great fortune of doing my master's degree research at Bering Glacier which is just east of Kayak Island, just east of where this Copper River input comes in. And um, USGS has been doing some uh, in-depth studies of that glacier for decades. Uh, and that one is really interesting because it's the largest temperate surging glacier in the world, I believe. And on, on the order of every decade or so, it releases a just incredible amount of freshwater input uh, in a just massive outburst flood. And um, I think it would be really interesting now that there's some sustained long-term opportunities for sampling the marine environment to take opportunities to look at how those glacial input floods uh, provide a, an experimental opportunity in the short term in like one year to look at massive changes in freshwater input from glaciers. So I'll just put a bug in, in the ear of folks that are working on glaciers in Alaska that I think that would be really interesting to keep an eye on that and when a surge happens, see if you could coordinate with the Seward Line folks. Because um, they're mostly focused on the Copper River plume input, which is more regular, um, but that Bering Glacier, I think, provides a nice experimental opportunity every now and again. Uh, yeah, and I suspect that the uh, elevated production off of Prince William Sound is, is the result of uh, iron coming into that system uh, with the runoff, perhaps some of it originating with the glaciers. Well, according to my watch, we have about three minutes left. So unless anybody has any uh, concluding remarks, I think we will um, wrap it up and uh, thank Ken again for the presentation. I just wanted to mention before we get off the line that the glaciers and um, sea level collaboration team will be hosting another meeting uh, next week. That's on Thursday, January 30th. Uh, so same day of the week, a little bit later in the day, 3 p.m. East Coast time. And that'll be a webinar focused on modeling Greenland ice sheet uh, meltwater. So it's joint hosted with the modeling collaboration sub team. We've got a presentation from Lauren Andrews, who's based at NASA Goddard, melt routing in GEOS, um, which is the Goddard Earth Observing System uh, model, the source and fate of ice sheet runoff. And then another presentation by Matt Hoffman from Los Alamos National Labs, um, interactions between surface melt and glacier dynamics in ice sheet and climate models. So a bit more um, physically oriented um, next week. And then uh, in a couple weeks on thir Thursday again, February 13th, um, 1 p.m. East Coast time, we've got how thick seriously Modern Measurements and Models of Glacier Thickness, and that will feature presentations by Daniel Farinati and Jack Holt. Um, but thank you all again for tuning in today or watching the recording. Thank you, Danielle, for initiating this idea for sort of an interdisciplinary uh, joint team meeting. And um, yeah, we'll let everybody, unless Danielle, do you have any comments upcoming? Uh no, I don't think so. I believe the Marine Ecosystems Next Call is at the end of February on the 26th. Um, so uh, look for uh, notices coming out about that. 
Thank you so much, everyone. And um, to everyone from the Glaciers team, you're always more than welcome to join the Marine Ecosystems Collaboration team and help us uh, think about uh, opportunities for interactions between our respective teams. I think this is a great introduction to the conversation, and uh, we're really happy to, to keep it going. So thanks so much, everyone. Ken, thank you so much for the great presentation, um, and we hope that we can help you find some new collaborators. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.